This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Hey team, we have a new sponsor here at the Crypto Conversation, BitGet, one of the world's leading copy trading cryptocurrency exchanges. Yes, indeed. What happens if you've got the funds to invest, but you don't have the time to keep track of the market? You still want to make smart money moves. What do you do? Well, copy trading is a popular choice for beginner traders. You can shorten your learning curve by uncovering tips and strategies from more experienced traders. BitGet's copy trading platform has over 80,000 elite traders to choose from and 380,000 followers just like yourself who are already using the BitGet copy trading platform as a potential passive income stream. All it takes is one click. You can subscribe to an elite profitable strategist, set your limits, automate your orders and monitor their trades. I've got some links in the show notes below. One link will take you through to the BitGet sign up page, give you a VIP discount. So learn all about it for yourself. Thanks to BitGet. And now it is on with the show. My guest today is Brian Corshane. Brian is the founder of of the Newport Beach based DAIM. I believe it's uh, one of the first uh, US registered investment advisors dedicated to crypto. Uh, We'll learn more about this today. Uh, Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, thanks for having me, Andy. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here, Brian. Let's do what we do at the beginning of the show. Be good if you could please introduce yourself. I really love to hear a little bit about your personal and professional backstory uh, and the lead up uh, to well, founding DAIM. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're here in in the United States, in California, uh, specifically in Newport Beach. Um, and where I come from in the background is uh, I got my start on Wall Street, actually on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I got with a guy and started uh, writing paper tickets and backing up their floor traders. And then I went on to be a trader in the pit there in the uh, on the option side. So I was there for 13 months. And then from there, I worked at different broker dealers in New York City, um, specifically as a vol uh, sales specialist. And that was great. And in 2014, uh, I came across Bitcoin on my own research. October, I made an allocation to it. It was the first one. And uh, from then on, I was kind of the go-to guy, um, you know, maybe... Nobody had a position on the floor. Nobody had a position in the building. And I was a guy that people came to when they had questions about the space. And this grew and grew and grew. And then in 2017, in the early part of the year, pre-ICO run-up, I had realized that there was a need for a properly licensed uh, advisor and asset manager in the space. Everything that was out there was self-directed. Coinbase, for example, you go on Coinbase, it's all up to you to move your own money, decide what to buy, when and how, and people just needed a human help to this. And so what I realized was that there was also a larger allocation that people wanted to make to the space, and they wanted to do it with someone that maybe had some kind of licensing that they could fall back on or recourse. And so um, I left the firm that I was working at in New York City and moved here to Newport Beach to start building this business to be the first of its kind um, licensed registered investment advisor in the United States to advise and manage assets for for individuals. And so uh, as fast track as that sound and as simple as it was, it was a bit more of a challenge than that at the time um, when we were dealing with the regulators and getting the business approved. Uh, it took us into 2018. Um, and for people who know prices, the price of Bitcoin had come off from the all-time highs in 2017. January 1st, it was 13500 And then by the time we got into May, it was sub 10000 And so the regulators kicked back a little bit saying they didn't want to license the first of its kind advisor in the space. Um, that was kind of defeating because I'd spent quite a bit of money and my own Bitcoin to, to build this and get it going. Um, but I didn't stop there. And I basically made a case with them saying, look, you got to approve this business. There's nothing like it out there that can actually help people. And I'm probably the most qualified thing you can get right now. I had um, the series four, which is an options principal. I had the series 24, which was a compliance officer. I had owned Bitcoin again since 2014. I had the series 65 and I said, people need help in this space. 
And we ended up getting the license. Uh, it was actually the next day after that phone call. So May 31st, 2018. And since then now, yeah, we, we advise and manage um, crypto positions for um, individuals in the United States and, and corporations. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, DAIM, of course, just stands for Digital Asset Investment Management. You yep. say then that you are, yeah, helping individuals um, with their crypto positions and allocations and uh, maybe even their decision making. Just talk us through a little bit more about what that means, uh, Brian. Who are the the kind of different uh, target markets or, or customer segments uh, that, that your firm services? Yeah, so uh, a typical client for us is generally uh, a business owner in the United States, quite busy with what he's got going on, uh, but wants to have an allocation to the space. Uh, generally, something much larger than you know a few thousand bucks or ten grand that somebody would put you know on on a typical exchange, you know Coinbase, Gemini, Kraken. Um, they want to make a larger allocation, maybe something in the hundreds of thousands or even millions to the space. And so they get with us, things look very familiar from kind of an onboarding standpoint to what their traditional investment advisor might look like. And then we have the license check where they can look us up on the, the SEC's website. And then we take them through um, a new client profile where we get to learn a little bit more about them. And we can then go with them about, okay, you know, this is the allocation we think you should make. Maybe sometimes we've got to walk them back from being too big. Um, and then this is the portfolio we want to put you in. And then from there, uh, it leads to usually a transfer of some sorts from uh, like a traditional uh, investment management firm, Schwab, Fidelity, stuff like that. So we handle the transfer, the funds land, and then we put in place um, our model portfolio, which is our best thesis on the space. And then we manage their assets according to that. And we actually run that across um, all of our discretionary clients. So our clients, not only do they get uh, an advisor and a manager sitting on top, with a license, but also a portfolio that gets professionally managed, kind of like a fund. The difference is, is that we run a flat fee and we don't add the performance fee on top of it. And so from there, once they're onboarded and invested, they get 24 seven view access into the account. They get regular statements. Um, if it's a taxable account here in the United States, we work on things like tax loss harvesting, should that be needed, 1099s, beneficiaries, and then we go into the tax advantage accounts. So we can do things like IRAs, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, SEP IRAs, uh, Roth 401ks. Um, and then we even do a corporate 401k where a business can put in place a plan for their employees that gives them the ability to have up to 10% in pure Bitcoin alongside traditional mutual funds. And this is something actually we're really excited about coming out of like a pilot program and it's something we want to expand into market. Yeah, I mean, but to jump into there, first first thing, Brian, I guess, yeah, the idea of having a even a small allocation into uh, people's uh, 401k funds um, would be obviously a, a good thing for Bitcoin and presumably uh, a good thing for individuals uh, that do have Bitcoin in, in their 401ks if over time Bitcoin does uh, appreciate. But do you see, is there a, there a demand for this and you can see this growing over time? Yeah, so the the four hundred one k market is quite large. The addressable market is just massive, and and there's just nothing servicing really alternative investments. And that's where where Bitcoin come comes into being kind of like a liquid, easier alternative investment to put into plans instead of something like real estate or VC funds. And so when we put the plan out and we we went and looked for pilots for this. We thought that it was going to come from mostly crypto native companies or tech startups, but what we found was quite different. We found that interest uh, came from traditional businesses, law firms, construction companies. And when we put the plan in place, when you look at like who wants to participate and who elects for Bitcoin and how much, you actually see it's kind of the crowd that's you know over 40 and professional and people that you wouldn't think would be so technology native, but it's people that kind of understand like you got to take a little bit of risk and Bitcoin's been around for a while and, and why not go for that? Um, because it actually does improve the sharp ratio of, of these portfolios. And so, yeah, it's been surprising to us, which is actually a good thing because eventually the people that are in the, the younger generations that are in tech startup or crypto events will get older. They'll have more money in their 401ks and eventually they'll have the option when they're ready to participate in this. 
Yeah, very well said. Um, so you said also, uh, Brian, that you almost uh, manage uh, like kind of like a fund, which is um, DAIM's, um, I guess, uh, crypto portfolio thesis, right? So yeah, um, that's correct. I wonder how much of that you're prepared to talk about in terms of, uh, I guess, what that what that fund portfolio breakdown in terms of crypto assets would look like. And it's you know it's 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 notoriously hard, obviously, to to beat Bitcoin uh, just with a buy and hold strategy over a, a, a kind of long time zone. Um, what's your approach to trying to, uh, I guess, beat the market on behalf of your clients? Yeah, I can talk about this quite a bit. So on, on the structure side of it, it's set up as it is SMA here in the United States. So separately managed accounts. So all of our clients actually have their own accounts and, and, this, and the assets are not co-mingled, but we do manage them with an overlay. And that way we can get the trades done and rebalancing as needed. And the great thing about that is it gets back to us being liquid at any time, unlike having a lockup period with a fund. And so when we have that structure, well, then we move into being able to manage these assets uh, quite easily and then offer our clients the liquidity that's needed. And then as the thesis, uh, when I first started the business and, and we were running our model portfolio back in 2018, it was Bitcoin only. Um, and we, we, we looked at the space as we want to have low turnover. We don't want to incur a lot of trading fees. We don't want to incur a lot of taxes in these accounts. But we also understand that being long crypto in itself is the best way to get multiples on your return. And then when you go to allocate away from Bitcoin and go to seek alpha, you got to see if you're going to have a strategic outperformance. And then what seems easy to say now, uh, in the beginning of 2020, um, we, we had you know done our research on Ethereum and the upgrades that were to come. And we decided to um, make a 20% allocation uh, to Ethereum at that time. Uh, from the book, uh, which worked out really well for us, and and um, you know it, it got to a point too where we've allocated away and and Bitcoin um, you know shrunk to be um, a little less than you know sixty percent of our portfolio, and then we allow these assets to take course. We look at everything from a fundamental standpoint. Um, when we do use technicals, it's really on just um, deploying and pulling out of positions, and so at the position we're at now. Well, I should back up. Um, last year, um, you know, we, we had closed out a majority of the Ethereum position into the upgrade and then went into cash for a while, which which helped us uh, through a bit of the downturn last year um, and gave us capital to start redeploying at the beginning of this year. And so um, in our search for alpha, we, we haven't quite found what we like um, outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So uh, we redeployed into Bitcoin, balanced the book 90% um, Bitcoin, 10% ETH. And now we're looking to make um, some strategic allocations away from both of those um, as we see us kind of being in the trough zone here, coming out of the bear market and entering a bull market. Yeah, fascinating. And uh, it's interesting, Brian, that you say it's it's very difficult to find uh, compelling uh, crypto asset allocations outside of uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, and I suppose uh, being so heavily overweight uh, Bitcoin at the moment looking forward, I suppose, uh, you know, that is probably due to uh, the two big catalysts, the two big narratives um, that are uh, around Bitcoin at the moment, of course, I'm talking of, of course, of uh, the fourth Bitcoin halving coming around uh, what April, March, April uh, next right. year, and of course the um, BlackRock's uh, spot uh, Bitcoin uh, application. So yeah, I'd love to understand just how you think about uh, those uh, two data points and and perhaps their their potential uh, to make Bitcoin interesting again. Yeah. And so, and there's something to touch on too, what you started off with is like, you know, yeah. looking at all the other investments outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so I'll, I'll hop into that in the second half of this answer. Um, but when it comes to uh, the halving and the BlackRock ETF, you know, uh, the, the, the halving is an event that's always on the radar and that, um, you know, has tend to see price appreciation somewhat after the event. And this stuff has become well known. But what really changed was seeing um, BlackRock come into the space, and that was further, you know, affirmation to us that, you know, we are entering a bull market, and there are some very big players that thinks that there's going to be um, severe demand and drastic price increases in the space. 
And so that's what that's another data set to us that says, okay, we don't want to be in, in cash anymore. We do need to be invested, even though we cannot find something at the moment outside of Bitcoin and ETH, we at least want to participate in the market and be in Bitcoin because the narrative can change very quickly in this space. And so uh, it, it comes to things like this too. If, if you look at like key figureheads in the space uh, and their price predictions, you got Arthur Hayes at 70,000, Guy Kiyosaki at 100,000. Um, you've got uh, Novogratz at 500,000. Kathy Woods is at a million. I think she might've revised her to like 1.3 million, but the end of 2023. And so, you know, I, the, that narrative, you know, micro strategy, acquiring more, there's just little things on the back end. And then you could see something drastic happening and you got to be ready for that. You know, in the next month, there could be some sort of approval for one of the Bitcoin ETFs. If that doesn't happen in January, there's actually talk that maybe multiple Bitcoin spot ETFs in the United States could get approved all at once. You have things that, you know, maybe Gary Gensler um, gets recalled. Like, these events could happen. What we think is that the bad events have already happened. We went through that last year. We went with that with Luna. We had FTX and we had Celsius. The bad actors have been weeded out. And so kind of any kind of regulatory stuff that comes in, we think won't have that drastic of an impact. We saw XRP do well in its case. And we think that the setup for new news and better news is on the horizon. And then you look at the liquidity on it. Um, you know, it's something that can vacuum very quickly to the upside. And then all that takes is the news agencies to just flip and go from doom and gloom to price appreciation. And it will it will show in Google and it will start to result in, in prices. Uh, so, yeah, it's that, that's our thoughts. And those are those are two big catalysts. Yeah, I'd say more so the, the Bitcoin ETF uh, over the halving at this point. Yeah, very well said. And uh, yeah, you're you're exactly right. I mean, Bitcoin is, it, it doesn't seem like it now because Bitcoin really has been uh, kind of trading in the range that it's in at the moment, just, uh, you know, somewhere between uh, 26,000 and 30,000, shall we say, for, well, for yeah. months, really. And so it does feel like, um, you know, you can call it what you want, the sort of the, the extended bear market the accumulation zone of of the next uh, bull market but it is uh, very well there, there's also there's two could, known sellers in the market almost every you know uh, at, at a regular basis the US government's still selling bitcoin yes. and you have and and you have um FTX that's starting to, to to unload some of their bitcoin and so you're getting matched up with you know hodlers still buying micro strategy coming in and it's just that's why you see this almost sideways slide you know and it's disconnect and and lack of correlation is because you got these two just unloading and acquiring and just trimming and then any news could just just set this off but the other thing is that it's possible um that our government stops selling at the end of this year and takes a break. They could continue, but if they take a break, well, there's one less seller in the market. Um, and then who knows, maybe what needs to be done in this tranche uh, for FTX also completes as they're projected to. And then now you're, you're relieving sell pressure. You get a Bitcoin approval in Q1 and this thing turns into a vacuum to the upside. Absolutely. Do, do you, um, I, I mean, I wonder what it's like, Brian, uh, to be in your position, like perhaps for, um, I'm sure you have clients who came in um, perhaps during the, the bull market of uh, 2021. Um, and, you know, it's it's hard for people who experience their first uh, crypto bear market and, uh you know, as much as the um, the, the velocity is uh, intense on the upside, it's also uh, pretty disquieting on, on the downside. Uh, yeah. What do you say to people who have uh, sort of started uh, with you in, in the good times, but now you've got to manage uh, not mm -hmm. only their assets uh, through the bear market, but I suppose, you know, their, their expectations and emotions as well? Yeah, yeah I mean, great question, Andy. And it, it brings me back to the second half of last year and I'll just the many conversations we had a lot of with a lot of our clients and you know talking about the space and and reassuring about our business partners and how well um they're here and and how good standing they're in and us and and when we onboard clients from the beginning 5 years ago even through the bull market in 2021 we go over downside slides with them and we talk about you know 
bad scenarios, you know, hey, you know, how do you feel if this is going to be down 80%, right? And we have those conversations early on when there's no money at play and there's no emotions and we make that plan. And you tend to find that most people can handle it. There could be a few that say, you know, I want to exit and close out. Um, but, you know, now that you have that conversation and it's kind of like out of the way, you can reflect back to, hey, this is the plan we put in place and this is what we're going to do. And for some of those, uh, you know, we, we can do, if they're a brokerage account, I mentioned earlier, we can do tax loss harvesting. So that's a way to, you know, take these losses and offset it, you know, against future tax payments. And there's an advantage to that. And, and now when you, when they stay in the game, they allow us to tax loss to harvest and prices come back. You get to you get to see some of these get back into the green, and they just had a nice you know discount to what they're going to be paying in future taxes. And so we try to find things like that. Um, other things that we do too is you know for IRAs we do stuff unique. We're able to stake in those. Um, in our model portfolios performance, uh, we've actually outperformed Bitcoin um, by about thirty percent by strategically allocating away and pulling back. So that helps as well too, adding units to the account. And we look at this space and, and can say like, hey, you know, in a year where asset prices came off drastically, we had some cash because we sold earlier. Um, so we're waiting to deploy that. We can tax lost harvest uh, what was down and around. And we're keeping up regular communications with you guys. Um, you know, we're tapping the street to get, you know, insight and, and affirmation that everybody's in good standing. And that's what really comes to um, good customer services, just trying to be in front of everybody and, and open for human communication. Cause that's something that most of the businesses in the space really self-directed. I mean, there's no one to talk to in DeFi, right? You can't call any of the businesses. Um, and, and even in, you know, the typical exchanges, uh, it could be hard to have a human to talk to. And, and that's where we've, you know, we, we pride ourselves in being available for our clients alongside running the model portfolio. Fantastic. And uh, talk to us, Brian, uh, in terms of, um, I guess, the uh, the success of DAIM, uh, your business, uh, you know, I'd love to understand uh, the, any sort of metrics that you watch in terms of uh, the growth in uh, your user base, your, your clients, your assets under management. Uh, I, I assume things are, are ticking along and, and growing over time. Yeah. So uh, when we started the business in 2018, uh, we, we started off with zero clients. It's the way the regulators want to do it. Uh, no assets under management. Um, and then a few regulatory audits in uh, in 2019, because they they liked that we we put uh, a crypto advisor and manager on there. So that slowed some growth. But then um, coming into the back half of, of 2020, um, we definitely caught a groove. We were, we were able to develop some some narrative and marketing in the confines of still Facebook and, and stuff, not, not allowing to have crypto advertising, but through our word of mouth and in our network and, and kind of hand to hand, um, you know, discussions. And so uh, we grew the business um, to over um, 200 uh, accounts. And really when we look back and, and we analyze the business today um, and we look at like, the AUM and, and how it fluctuated and the number of clients, I think a lot of companies will see a drastic drawdown in AUM. Um, and they will also see a drastic drawdown in number of accounts. Now their, their, their accounts might still have a dollar value, but I mean, meaningful accounts, you know, anything over 10 grand. Whereas we'll see that we've kind of, we've trimmed flat through, um, the back half of 2021 and, and now are like slowly increasing. Um, and I think the temperature changed. It felt like right around March um, that you know, individuals were open to getting back in the space. Kind of that really bad hangover from November was behind them. And so I think things are going to get even more favorable uh, for us. Um, Google's just done an update uh, on their systems and advertising, which is something we've, we've really never been able to use before. And we're, we're excited to go down that road. Um, and they, they've, <laughs> to, to us reaching out to them many times, uh, I don't know if it's directly because of us, but yeah, now they have a way to kind of quantify yourself and qualify yourself as a, as a crypto business to be able to advertise on Google. So we're excited to see um, how this goes. Very nice. All right. Well, as we finish off this part of the podcast, then Brian, you know, for anyone listening in the US who is uh, perhaps intrigued by the sound of your business and 
uh, your track record with perhaps uh, being able to even outperform Bitcoin. Um, yeah, what should they do? Where should they go if they want to learn uh, more about DAIM? Yeah, DAIM.io, like Internet Operations, is our website. Um, if you reach out to us on there, we can put you on our monthly newsletter. Um, and then inside of that, we're on Twitter giving out like like kind of up-to-date, uh, more relative thoughts on the space. And so the website's definitely number one. Uh, Twitter, we're out there too. Um, LinkedIn's a great thing. And then we have some events um, in the United States. If you happen to be in, in California, we do like a, um, a lunch and learn on occasion. Um, and these are usually um, like C-suite executives. Um, and so those are things that um, you know we find help spread the word and also lead to um, the 401k, right? And so if you have a business out there and you're looking for something exciting, to retain key employees in a tight labor market, a 401k like this with the Bitcoin could be something exciting for them uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're here. There's there's even a phone number that we can be called at, which is pretty rare for the space. So Sounds good. All right. Well, I'll put links uh, to those in the Appreciate show notes. That, Andy. Do you want to just shout out that phone number just for anyone who wants yeah, to? Yeah, it's 949-298-7500. It's, it's Seven five eight two nine four nine two nine eight seven five eight two, and the email is hq at daim dot io. And and uh, Andy, I got to give you a shout out too. I, uh, you know, being that I've I've followed your your podcast and I listened to the one with Fred, I, I highly recommend um, listeners if you haven't checked that one out, uh, check out Fred from uh, Marathon, a really great recent podcast um, of yours. And then the website's also great too. The guy, the way you guys, you know, put prices and give some of the the recent news. Yep. Oh, well, appreciate that. Thank you so much, Brian. I reckon we go to a very quick break and then we'll come back. We'll have some fun. Uh, we'll run Brian through the very famous Crypto Conversation hot take around back in one second. Look, we'd all like to say we're pro traders, but the reality is we're probably not. But with BitGet, you don't have to be. Why? Because BitGet is the world's largest copy trading exchange. Instead of you muddling through it on your own, feel confident. BitGet allows you to automatically copy trade from over 80,000 elite traders with 24-7 support on our secure copy trading platform. Start following expert traders on BitGet.com. Check for details in the show notes and join BitGet today. All right, we are back and I'm with uh, Brian Corshane. Brian is the founder of uh, D-A-I-M, uh, which of course stands for Digital Asset Investment Management uh, for all sorts of uh, individuals and businesses in the US. Uh, but Brian, I like to finish each podcast uh, with a quick round of rapid fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? I'm up. Let's do it. All right, let's do it, Brian. Just going to run some questions at you, kind of hot take style. Um, yeah, question one for you then, Brian. Uh, where would you say that you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist uh, to multi-chain opportunist spectrum? Uh, I would say on the 60-40 side, Hey, 60% Bitcoin maximalist, but we're definitely <laughs> open to some of these other projects that are great. Of course. Uh, what would you say then, Brian, is your firmest conviction uh, crypto opinion? Oh, um, that Satoshi Nakamoto uh, is a group, an anonymous group, but they've done a great job of removing themselves um, and, and just setting up a really great belief system in the network here and also storing away those million coins i mean that's the whole belief in the space yeah and uh be in everyone's interest if uh their true identities uh were never discovered right <laughs> yep which wouldn't be a bad thing we have yeah. our own theory on that um all right bill gates famously said brian that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10 you know with that in mind uh, whatever you like uh, bitcoin crypto web3 uh, but 10 years uh, further into the future uh, what do we start to see do you think yeah well especially with ai i think like 
that statement's going to be skewed a bit. I think we we can start to achieve more things in two years. I mean, it, it's been an incredible advancement, especially what we've employed here at, at, at our firm. Um, and so I think you're just going to, in, in 10 years time from now, you're going to see a real ease of use of Web3 interconnected with cryptocurrencies across multi-coins. It's going to be extremely seamless, uh, almost like now when you open your iPhone, you know, you got a retina scan, it, it, it opens and does all that stuff's going to be registered and it's going to be a real ease of use and and with a very great um, decentralized experience where, you know, if you want to be in advertising and advertise too, you can, but if you want to be own, your own and independent and, and protect your privacy, you're going to be able to do that really easily. I like it. All right, William Gibson said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. With that in mind, can you think of an example of the future being here right now, Brian, but most people aren't aware of it? Um, have you, well, let's see here. Um, have you seen Jeff Bezos lately? I mean, he, he, I don't know what he's got for a workout plan and meal plan, but he looks pretty good. I think, I think he's got the future, but it's not available to everybody else yet. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a great example, actually, because how, how old do you think Be- Bezos is? I don't know. I'd have to cheat, but he he might he might live longer than anybody's ever lived at the, at, at what he's got at his disposal. Yeah. So I'm okay. To see. Google says he's uh, 59 years old. So it's not he's not super old. He's not like a, a Biden or, or anything like that. But yeah, Bezos looks jacked. Not a at day the over. Moment. Doesn't look a day over 40. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think on that note, the kind of just the general longevity space that you'll see a, a, a lot happening there over the next decade. Oh, oh pardon. One more time, Andy. I, I lost you. Oh, the, just uh, longevity. Uh, all sorts of, um, yeah, uh, pills, potions and science designed to help uh, humans extend their lifespan. That, that space is just going to explode. Oh, it's it. Yeah. I mean, the health sciences side for sure. Uh, Elderly care um, and I guess a a glimpse into the future uh, from a movie standpoint here in the United States. I mean, you got Wally and it's it's a movie that kind of accurately depicts that Um, and it and it it merges in all aspects of what Web3 could be cryptocurrency. biopharmaceuticals that can help us live forever. Um, And then just like the whole consumer uh, economy going to just instant and being delivered right in front of you. And and, uh, we're headed that way. Uh, So position yourself uh, ahead of time for which part you want of it you want to enjoy. Absolutely. So well said. Uh, Time to get weird just for a second, Brian, if we haven't got weird, weird already. If we zoom out, what do you see as the long term future for the human race? Do you see dystopia or utopia? Uh, utopia definitely um and, and one thing that like i read recently and looked at was um over in the middle east this great wall that they've already started digging that they're going to build that's going to be you know a, a whole center to house millions of people um if you didn't have a utopic you know, outlook on life you wouldn't take down the largest construction project in the world right to do and so yeah definitely on the positive side yeah and it brings us nicely to our final question and perhaps you did kind of already answer it uh with wally but uh what is your favorite science fiction uh, book film or tv show yeah i mean that's the one I mean, it's 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 something uh, every couple of years i watch uh, my son will soon watch um but yeah it's, it's definitely that one it just seems so accurate at forecasting what life could be like yeah, so that was, of course, Wally was, um, yeah, 2008. Um, oh, yeah. It yeah. it'd probably seemed even more relevant watching it uh, and watching it now. Absolutely. All right. Great selection. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and look, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show and spending some time with us. And nothing else to do, really, except, again, just uh, tell people who are interested uh, where they can go to to learn more about you and your team's offerings. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening to this podcast. And uh, you can catch us at uh, daim.io. And again, the phone number from before, 949-298-7582. Email us hq at daim.io. Again, Brian here, the founder and CEO. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much, Brian. All the best and bye for now. Thanks, Andy. All right, there you go. Uh, Thank you so much uh, to Brian. 
from DAIM for coming on the show. Shout out to Warley. That was an excellent selection from Ryan. Of course, uh, animated sci-fi movie, yeah, from uh, 2008. A machine responsible for cleaning a waste-covered earth meets another robot and falls in love. Together they go out on a journey that will alter the fate of mankind. I think the the message in the movie is uh, humans make and use too much stuff. And if we keep going down this path, eventually uh, the planet will be overwhelmed with toxicity and extinction. So, yeah, there you go. Hmm. All right. Thank you, team, for listening uh, to this episode of the show. Please make sure you're subscribed to the Crypto Conversation. Uh, But that is it for today. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coin. See you.